here in this first segment. We welcome in Chris Miller. And uh, Chris, it's been rumored for a while, is going to make a run for governor in the state of West Virginia. And I think he's about to make it official. Chris, good morning to you, sir. Man, how, about, how are you guys? We're doing well. Hey. Yeah, man. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm uh, filing for my run for governor of the state of West Virginia this morning. And I'm driving to Charleston right now to go get that job done. So looking forward to it. It's going to be a busy day, packed full of all kinds of stuff. And you guys are the first call. Nice. Congratulations, Chris. We appreciate you making us a part of your day as well. Exciting. Always good to call in and talk to you guys. And uh, I'm going to be up in your neck of the woods quite frequently over the next several months. So look forward to sitting down with you face to face, too, at some point in time. Excellent. You, whenever you're in the area, you know, well, obviously, we got a chair for you here, man. Hey, let's talk I'll, about your decision I'll, to run for governor. Uh, first and foremost, tell us why you think you'd be an excellent governor. Well, um, I think we've seen uh, through the past several years that um, people are tired of politicians and want more business guys involved in running things. And I've never been involved in politics. I've made my entire career and my entire living in the private sector, signing the fronts of paychecks and employing people. Um, I've built a uh, large set of businesses. I've got 26 different enterprises that employ about 750 people. Um, we're in five different states, heavily invested in West Virginia. And I want to see our state thrive and grow. And we got a bunch of problems coming down the pike, but we have an incredible rare window of opportunity where we could do something spectacular. And I'm just tired of watching politicians get involved and not do anything. And so the time is to act. The time is to act now. And I'm a business guy that understands economics and understands how to create jobs, and I want to roll up my sleeves and get to work for the West Virginia people. Chris, what will be some of the most important things for you if you are the next governor of West Virginia in terms of getting things enacted? So it has to be everything that we do has got to be about economic growth and economic development. Uh, West Virginia also has some special things because we're still conservative. We're still a Christian-based state, and we want to retain those values, too. Um, if we look at what's going on around the state and realizing that we've got to enact some really pro-growth economic policies, three of the four fastest-growing states post-pandemic are Tennessee, Texas, and Florida, and they all have one thing in common, and that is a zero state income tax. So that's one of the first things we've got to do to accelerate and get done. Secondly, we're living in a time where everything that we do is going to be about energy. As we grow technology, we have to have the power to fuel it. And if you look at West Virginia, we have an abundance of coal. We have an abundance of natural gas. We now have the potential for nuclear. And we've got an incredible amount of water that passes through our state, more, more than any other state in the country, basically. We also own the Ohio River to the high water mark of Ohio. And when you add all that stuff up, I believe that we can make West Virginia the battery or the power plant of the East Coast and export our power and also simultaneously drive down the cost of power for our people and make our state and union the cheapest power in the country and use that for a lot of foundation for economic growth and development. And, and I, I could go on a while, you know, on, on this for a while because there's so much low-hanging fruit. We've got to hit the singles and the doubles right off the bat when it comes to getting the job done and getting the economy cranking. And then we've got to think big picture when it comes to economic growth and development, too, because – West Virginia, all of these resources that we've got, there's no reason why we aren't, the, we aren't one of the richest per capita states in the country. The water, the lumber, the coal, the natural gas, and we've got to leverage these things properly to do something for our people. And while we're at it, why don't we start running state government a bit more like a business? Because if I ran my businesses the way the government spends our tax dollars, I'd be broke. And I think we ought to realize we need to respect the taxpayer and start treating them more like valued customers and doing everything we can with a single-minded purpose of making their lives better. Chris, this is not something that's a new idea for you. You've been looking into running for governor for the better part of a year. And in that time, yes, you've sir. traveled the state, met a lot of West Virginians. What have you learned and what have they told you? Well, man, so West Virginians are some of the best people on planet Earth. And one of the funniest things for me to see and watch is traveling all around the state is how tribal West Virginia is. I mean, we're, we're, we might be more tribal than Afghanistan. You've got 55 counties with 55 different perspectives, 
55 different groups of people. And they're all still at the end of the day, good old Southern people that really just are worried about what the cost of a gallon of gas is and the cost of a gallon of milk is. And one of the most important things that we can do as the government is to make sure and provide tangible jobs and grow an economy to make sure that all these people have the opportunity to keep their kids here. Because if you're talking about the hearts and the minds of people, because that really is what elections are about, they're not about the political class. They're about the people. The thing that is on the tip of people's tongues and the front of their minds all the time is that our biggest export right now is not our coal and it's not our natural gas. It's our kids. And we want to we want to create an economy that keeps our kids here and provides them a chance to raise their families here in West Virginia, too. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, good morning, Chris. Uh, glad that you joined us this morning. Uh, I have two or three questions, but first about your background. Uh, it's my understanding that the uh, the automobile uh, dealership that you've built up is in great part due to you yourself. You inherited the, the kernel, but a lot of the expansion, expansion has been through you. Is that correct? Yeah. W- when I got involved in our family business, um, we had two of them and had about 60 employees. And through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and systematic hard work, I was able to turn that into 26 different enterprises. We're in the automotive space and real estate and insurance, reinsurance and bison farming. And I've got a data and technology company too. But, you know, one of the best things that my dad ever did for me is when I was 10 and a half years old, I told him I wanted a pair of Air Jordan tennis shoes. And when he found out they cost $125, you know what he told me? Get a job. And so I got a paper out and I've been working ever since. And did was a newspaper delivery boy for two and a half years and then got involved in doing farm work and learned everything there is to know about running a farm because we've got that bison far, farm on the border of Cabell and Mason counties. And we you know, cleared fields and built barbed wire fence and cured and skinned locust trees to make fence post corners, ran heavy equipment, learned how to weld. And you know, everything that I've done has always been around hard work. So when I was able to get involved in our family's businesses, because of those lessons I was taught as a kid on a farm and delivering newspapers, I was able to roll up my sleeves and, and do something that's really, really hard to do, which is exponentially grow a business. That's what I did. Yeah, uh, Chris, in your one of your write-ups, I noticed that uh, you highlight several things that you'd like to work on. Uh, one would be education. Another one, you say you'd like to reduce power bills by something like 70 to 80 percent because of our abundant energy. You mentioned foster care. Uh, you mentioned two or three other things. All good points, ones that we're somewhat familiar with. But then you went on to say that one of the most important things we should do is to realize the surplus needs to be conserved in a much more future forward thinking. We have to look at the budget cycle that's going to turn down in 8, 10, 12 years down the road. How can you reconcile uh, uh, the money that we need? And you say we need more money in the foster care. We need more money in education and yet preserve the surplus that we're sitting on. Great question. Every single thing that we do in the future and every single problem that we face can be solved with solid economic growth. And the thing that we have to do over the next 10 to 12 years is add about 200,000 people to our state. And what we do by doing that, by enacting real pro-business, pro-job creation type policies and drive the population to the state, because we already know that data company that I told you about, that data company basically tells us that we're in the beginning stages of a demographic shift in our country. People got tired of being locked in the cities during, during the pandemic, surrounded by concrete, and they couldn't go to the church, see their friends and family, and that kind of stuff. So they're wanting to move, and it just so happens that West Virginia has what they're looking for, high quality of life, low cost of living, stones throw away from basically two-thirds of the country's population, and yet some of the best people on planet Earth in a conservative-type mindset. We start ramping up our economy and growing our population. We have more revenue. We have more tax bases. We have more ability to address the foster care system. We have more ability to address the, the, the curtailment of the opiate epidemic. We have more ability to do things like address the Department of Highways because that's a major conundrum. We have more ability to address the future state budget because right now we're in a good spot, but down the road it gets bad really quickly because of our declining population and our aging population. But then you start thinking about what happens when you ramp up an economy. All of these other things that 
we all wind up getting impacted by not only taxpayers but businesses. Workers' comp modifiers, all of a sudden those go down. Healthcare, all of a sudden you've got more you've got more people to mitigate health care costs. The cost of health care goes down. Property and casualty goes down. All of this stuff goes down. And so if we really start thinking about the problems that we face, there's a solution to all of them, and that is growing our population by growing our economy and doing it based on the things that we know because of data people are looking for. Let me ask uh, two specific questions, and I'll turn it over to my colleague. Uh, one, uh, with education, I'm going to ask him. A, a, well, Bill, a, uh, Chris only has three minutes left okay, here. Okay, so let me go to Bill. Go Bill, Bill, yeah, Sorry Bill go right ahead. So, uh, good morning, Chris. And uh, um, I'm the uh, public health director uh, here in Berkeley County. So definitely when you're talking about um, the tax base and things of that nature, we we generate a lot of that in Berkeley County being the fastest growing um county and state have been for as long as I can remember as well as being the second largest um, county and probably within the next couple of years will be the largest with our infrastructure yes, and so, so one of the question or one of the comments you made was in regards to the opioid uh, epidemic that we have across the state I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on on that as far as harm reduction clinics because in in Charles or in Berkeley County we have a pretty robust um, uh, harm reduction clinic we're seeing people coming through our clinics, getting them in programs, getting them clean, getting their lives reestablished. Um, but part of those programs are our syringe access programs. And, and we have we have legislators in Charleston that want to do away with those clinics. Um, without that, you can't really get them through the doors. So I'm kind of interested in, in knowing what your take would be on harm reduction clinics and, and the opioid am- epidemic. So definitely want to touch on this first. The Eastern Panhandle and right there in that market in Martinsburg is going to be one of the most important areas for economic growth and development to save the state of West Virginia, by the way. And it's something in my perspective, traveling all around the state, that anywhere that you go, the Northern Panhandle, the Eastern Panhandle, everybody thinks that the resources go to the wrong place. We need to make sure that we have the appropriate resources to support what the Eastern Panhandle is going to be doing for us in the future when it comes to actually saving the state because of where it's geographically located, right there by Maryland, right there by D.C. Um, one of the other things I definitely want to touch on is, is that there will never be a governor in the history of West Virginia that is more passionate about cleaning up the remaining issues with the opiate epidemic than me. I've been sober from alcohol and opiates since April 1st of 2004, and I understand the struggle and I understand the battle. Um, I don't think that we get rehabilitation right still to this day. I think we need to focus on rewiring the pathways of the brain of the addict, and it takes 13 months. You've got to incorporate one-on-one in group sessions. You have to incorporate responsibilities. You have to incorporate jobs. You also have to make sure and incorporate rigorous exercise because that's one of the most important things to do to refire all of the pathways in the brain when it comes to producing the dopamine and the serotonin needed to maintain stability and sobriety. And then also, you know what else we need to do? We need to incorporate trade training inside of rehabilitation because the number one reason for relapse is lack of economic opportunity. And we have an entire generation of kids that haven't learned how to do anything. They've gone, some of them have gone off to college and got degrees in art history, strapped with student debt, and now they're living in their parents' basement. And there is such a demand for people that can actually do stuff that this just makes common sense for me in my mind when it comes to how we holistically start treating addicts. The harm reduction thing, that's a whole separate conversation. I think you need to really dig into where the needles are coming from and to make sure that they're not just out proliferating all over the streets because one of the things where I'm from in Huntington that we see is that there's needles all over the place. They're all over the place. And they're being given out in very, very massive amounts. And there's no real care. There's no real true exchange when one is exchanged for another. And if we're talking about making sure that we have an economy that grows and thrives, businesses are not going to want to come to a place where there's needles scattered all over the place. So it's something we really do need to be looking at, quite frankly. Um, And you still have to wind up looking at all the data that shows what happens to the overall health care costs in the long run. But at the end of the day, like when you incentivize something, you're going to get more of it. And I think that we incentivize the wrong way rehabilitation. It needs to be focused on holistically treating the addict and getting them sober over a long period of time, not just like handing out needles and substantiating the addiction. Chris, I know you have to get going. I thank you very much for making us your first stop this morning as you officially file for governor. How can people find out more about your campaign? 
You can go to millerforgov.com. You can check out our Facebook page, which is Chris Miller for Governor. And also um, would love to have any comments or feedback right there. Um, plus, um, you know, like I said, this is the first stop we've had today. It's going to be a fun, busy day, but I will be up in the Eastern Panhandle on February the 16th and 17th. So love to stop by and chat with you guys face-to-face and spend a little bit more time. Let's save a chair for you right now. Awesome. Thank guys, you. thanks so much for the time. Thank you, Chris. Have a great day.